here to introduce our next panel on 3D printing and social impact. Um, and this is a very special panel today um, because um, these folks are actually sponsors of the event. So they sponsor the food that you're eating right now. Um, so <laughs> So we'd really love to thank uh, Enable Community Foundation and Enable International Haiti. Um, and they are going to do a, a presentation right now about their work and the potential for social impact in the space. So I will turn it over to Grace Mascali. Thanks so much. That means you have to save some sandwiches for us. <laughs> I'm Grace Mastali. I have the pleasure and the honor of uh, being the CEO of the Enable Community Foundation, which you will soon learn a great deal more about from the co-founder of the Enable Community Foundation, John Schall, who is also a research scientist at Rochester Institute of Technology, and perhaps most importantly, the creator and founder of the Enable community, which he started, and I'm sure you'll tell him how, um, as a Google Plus community. Um, the Enable community, as you may know from the earlier panels, is probably the, um, the pointy part of the sphere of the emerging movement of makers, I'm sorry, I'm getting too far away from this, um, both in the US and in the developing world. Also on our panel um, is Eleanor Meeks, who is the co-founder of Enable International Haiti. You may gather there's a theme here. Um, Enable International Haiti, um, as well as a writer, film producer, um, and um, doer of social services, both in the U.S and now in Haiti. On Eleanor's right is Bo, who just emailed me his bio. <laughs> and Bo is an aerospace engineer, who I'm about to tell you about, <laughs> once I find the email he just sent me. Bo Pollitt is an aerospace engineer with 10 years experience in structures design um, and you'll hear throughout this how important the design element is to all things 3D printed. Um, he's worked with many um, government contractors, DARPA, one of my favorite defense agencies, um, and he currently and most importantly runs a composite materials um, fabrication business, which is pronounce it. It's pronounced Theta Composites. Theta Composites. But he's here today um, representing one of the premier international um, maker organizations, another um, leader in this emerging field. Um, Tom, Ticon Alum Makers Global. Um, so since we have, we're running a few minutes late, um, I'm not going to frame at this point what I expect you to hear from the three panelists. Um, I will take my shot um, during the Q&A that I hope you will allow time for. Dr. Shaw. <coughs> Grace set it up really right. I think there is an emerging movement here, um, um, uh, and, and I think we've sort of caught the wave of it. Um, and Enable describes itself as a global network of passionate volunteers using 3D printing to give the world a helping hand. And metaphorically, I think all of the organizations here are part of this, and it goes actually way beyond 3D printing. Um, but this all started for me when I saw a YouTube video uh, in which a South African carpenter, pictured here, mentioned that he had lost his fingers in a shop accident and had found his way through the internet to a puppet maker in Washington State who bizarrely had published a YouTube video of a device that he had made, a removing prop, 
And the two had collaborated over the course of a year to develop a simple mechanical body-powered device, which they first prototyped mechanically, then they 3D printed, and then they realized it could be useful. That's what the YouTube video said. And I took inspiration from the comments of this YouTube video. I may be the only person who has taken inspiration from the comments of the YouTube video. Uh, and I posted a note saying, if you have a printer and you want to help, put yourself on this funny map I made. And if you know someone who needs a hand, put yourself on this map. And that night there were seven pins on the map, and 90 days later there were 70 pins on the map. And people started calling me saying, okay, now what do we do? <laughs> and I didn't know, so I created a Google Plus community, and it has been growing uh, by about 1 to 5% a week. So this week we have 8,300 volunteers, and next week we're going to have 8,400 volunteers. And as I say, it has become a movement. And that original primitive hand has now mutated and evolved to produce a number of these devices that you see here. They all have the same basic operating principle. Grace will show that when you bend the elbow, it makes a fist, and I will show that when you bend the wrist, it makes a fist. And these are created now, these days, by grown-ups and children all over the world with 3D printers. And I'm going to let you pass this around and just see that it works, because when you bend the wrist, these little strings, fishing line, causes the fingers to bend. Now, when I give one of these devices to a kid these days, and this little episode has happened not for me a few thousand times so far, I like to say, now remember, with great hands comes great responsibility. Um, if it's a child, I'll go on to say, now in about six months to a year, you're going to outgrow this device, and we may not give you a new one. But you're likely to have access to a 3D printer, and I want you to start making better hands for yourself and for other kids. And these kids believe it, and because, right? And because they believe it, I believe it. And this kid on the left, who is not a kid, I'll grant you, um, he got a hand from us, as you can see. Um, and within weeks, Stephen Davies of England was making arms for other kids. And a few months ago, he published his own elbow actuated arm, a sample of which is right there. And so this thing is spreading, and it's spreading in a really interesting way. You'll notice these don't look like conventional prosthetics, and that's because our marketing director, um, who received one of these hands uh, two Christmases ago, was caught smiling and saying, I got a new Iron Man. And our community, within weeks, was producing Iron Man hands, and Wolverine hands, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle hands, and it got sort of out of hand. But the superhero, the superhero movie turned out to be a really powerful one, at least for kids in the West. But the superheroes are also the kids who are making these devices. I really enjoyed the education panel recently. There are now 200 schools we can identify around uh, the country that are using this as a project-based learning activity for children in schools. They're making them for classmates, they're making them for kids and adults they don't even know. In some cases they've made them for their principal and their school superintendent. And if you look at the girls in this particular classroom who did it, you can see that they're learning trigonometry, they're learning a little bit of mechanics and a little bit of 3D design, but if you look at their faces you can see they're also learning what this is really good for. And by the way, that would, would have been my comment on the educational <coughs> seminar, is that part of the reason this really works is that it's no longer just about learning. It's about doing and making and helping. And that is hugely motivating for the kids. And it's happening all over the place. And as it happens, some kid or adult gets one of these hands, from this strange community on the internet, and the newspaper picks up the story, and the story spreads, and more people say, I know someone who could use a hand like this, and even more people say, I would really like to be a part of this. And so we are now all over the world. It's happening in schools, it's happening in Boy Scout troops, it's happening at fab labs and maker spaces, and it's become uh, something of a movement that does not have a name yet, although this week my favorite phrase is, 
the connected humanitarian movement. And as we go global, by the way, we're discovering some interesting challenges, some of which we learned um, most clearly from the Haiti project, we're going to hear about uh, in a minute. Uh, in particular, that these superhero hands, which are such a big hit here, are not actually what they're looking for in many more conservative and developing countries. They want devices that look more natural looking. And indeed, you can see we're making progress. This also is a 3D printed hand. Um, and this is an early recipient of a 3D printed skin tone hand. And we're getting there. But we'll really get there when this kid in Africa begins designing and learning and making and sharing solutions. And so, which is sort of where we're at. Um, that's sort of an overview of where we came from and where we're going. And one of our pilots was, in fact, uh, the Enable Haiti Project, about which you will soon hear more. Thank you. I'm co-founder, let's see, there we go, uh, yep, hello, okay, better, um, so, <coughs> I'm just, okay, so um, I'm just going to jump in, we started um, as a team of volunteers, all Enable um, compatriots are volunteers, um, we set out to explore how Enable devices and, and its approach might be adapted to the developing world, in particular in Haiti, um, where even before the earthquake, uh, access to health care was um, and remains uh, very difficult. Um, we got a grant uh, from the Genesis Generation Challenge. We were one of um, nine winning teams. Um, uh, and actually, uh, although the, um, the projects are not specifically at all required to have a connection to Judaism, the, the foundation that gave us the grant uh, does have some very interesting connections, and it was given by Mayor Bloomberg. Um, and uh, the Tikkun Olam theme, of course, is very interesting in that regard. I don't know if Bill is going to talk about that. Um, I'm just wondering if anybody here came from any of the local DC Jewish groups. Okay, anyway, that's how we started. Um, we quickly learned um, about some distinctive characteristics of healthcare in Haiti, uh, which you can see here. Um, and I'm sure these are true in other places. I think they're, they're on the extreme end, even in developing world uh, countries. Um, lack of centralization, um, difficult communication, the transport system has got a lot of obstacles and so on. Um, so we began to explore um, how we might develop productive partnerships. Um, and as we were trying to identify the best maker spaces originally and then clinics, we were also learning um, as John indicated, not only that the superhero theme did not have a lot of resonance in, in Haiti, but people really were not looking for hands. They were looking for arms. There were a lot of amputations, um, not all related to the earthquake. Um, and not only did they want arms, but they cared almost less about the functionality than about what's called in this area cosmesis, or how it looked, whether it would fill a sleeve so that they were less noticeable. Um, in public. Um, there's a lot of stigma against the handicap. So um, these were some of the things we were exploring. Um, this, this, is, uh, uh, this is in Jeremy, Haiti. This is Dante, our fearless leader of the team. Um, working with one of our partners, we had an event in a local church. And the other picture, the woman in pink, is um, uh, Dr. Catherine Wolf, who uh, lives in Haiti and started a clinic with her, uh, with a, a nurse, a Haitian nurse, um, and she's a, a public health, uh, very interesting public health um, advocate and designs a lot of interesting projects. So, uh, John 
mentioned some of the ARM advances um, that we are trying to implement. Um, and what our focus became um, was um, an initiative to train the next generation of Haitian uh, prosthetists and prosthetic techs. So um, on the far right, the graduates there um, came out of um, a USA program and Handicapped <coughs> International program uh, and became prosthetic techs, nicely qualified with very few job opportunities. So we are coming in and teaching a course um, in June to that cohort um, to give them 3D printing skills. We'll leave equipment behind um, and we will try to keep them going with our various partners. There's Dr. Wolf again, Shirley, there's Pascal, the prosthetist um, at our partner clinic in Port-au-Prince. <coughs> and uh, below there is um, a group um, that represents another new partnership we have with the Victoria Hand Project, which has been doing some 3D printing um, of prosthetics uh, in Guatemala and Nepal, and they have their own really interesting designs. So we're very excited about that partnership. And again, these are the names of them. The clinic is Healing Hands for Haiti. There's the clinic in Jeremy's Friends for Health, Victoria Hand Project. That's the facility in Jeremy. <coughs> Excuse me. And... Um, this is just a little farewell look of what some of this building can be. Is it going to come on? If you can like escape, Eleanor. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. those dance moves, but I'll try. Uh, my name is Bo. I'm here to talk about kind of the, uh, the other side of the coin of this operation. Um, before I get into technical lingo and such, uh, what I want to say is that I uh, help run a makerspace out in Reston called Nova Labs. It's a great place. There's a lot of great makerspaces out there doing great things. They range from uh, commercial enterprises to local library makerspaces in schools in uh, workplaces and, and also in community centers, which is very much what, what ours is like. Um, and, and the concept I want you to think about here when, when I'm explaining this, this thing called Tom, uh, think of it like TED, like a TED talk, but it's a Tom Makeathon. Uh, and it's kind of trying to, to capture and bottle that spark that John spoke about in the very beginning of his presentation, which was before the Enable program was able to do all the great things that it's doing, uh, there was that moment where a puppeteer came in contact with a carpenter who lost his fingers, right? So how do you capture that? How do you manufacture that blend of technology and need case? And that's what Tom is. And so I'm going to show you a video on that. Try refreshing it. Thank you. Go back. And there we go. All right. <laughs> I don't have anything to 
like grab objects and then move them. Right now I'm doing that with my teeth. So when I heard about this weekend, I just thought, oh my god, this is what I have been like thinking about for years, which is getting people like myself who need Nords and sitting down with professionals, putting our ideas together and making things that will actually help people. Not just with the intent of helping people, but like really helping people. Oh, here we go! Might as well just leave that screen up here while I'm talking. Okay, great. So uh, I'll try and do this in just a few minutes, but I want to give you the, the basics here. So TOM stands for Tikkun Alom Makers. It's a concept that originally came out of an Israeli startup. Uh, they wanted to do this thing called Tikkun Alom, meaning to repair the world, to fix problems. And uh, what they were doing is exactly what John was talking about. It's how do you, how do you bring people together, people who really understand a, de a demand, a uh, need knower, in this case someone with a disability or who works every day with a disability, uh, and a maker, somebody who can create kind of a grassroots solution. And the reason we needed this is because there was a gap in the free market economy in which if there was a very customized need that wasn't a high value product, or if there was something that wasn't a very large market space, then commercial markets don't really want to invest in developing those solutions, marketing and distributing, if there really aren't that many um, use cases. Imagine, if you will, a size 37 shoe, right? Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of market for that. And if you need a size 37 shoe, you're in a difficult spot in your life, especially if you don't have a lot of money. And so that's what we were trying to do. And so we would uh, start by recruiting people who had special needs from organizations like American Cerebral Palsy, ALS, uh, and then we would get sponsors like Google.org who wanted to help make all this a reality. And then we would bring them together with makers at a local maker space. And it was a very community organization. It was very local people helping each other, working together. It's a 72-hour event. We're throwing the first one that's ever been taking place in the D.C. area on July 22nd. Please grab a flyer if you, if you are interested in learning more. Um, whether it be a sponsor, a maker, or if you have somebody in your life that you want to uh, participate as a need knower. And uh, so that's, that's what we're doing. That's the whole goal of, of this kind of movement is to create more content so that groups like Enable can have uh, you know, more pins on maps. So green pins are for hands and blue pins are for feet and yellow pins are for people that want cup holders that don't spill when they walk with their crutches and all kinds of things uh, that really help people live their lives. And I, you know, I, I talked about some of kind of the quaint ones, the ones that we can all identify with. Um, but I think he also mentioned some of these are more than just enabling. Some of them are about giving people their independence. It's about giving people back their dignity. And uh, I'll tell that quick story about the woman you saw there. Um, she was uh, very comfortable living her life. She'd grown up uh, without arms her whole life. And so she had picked things up with her teeth, and it wasn't a big deal for her. But she noticed that when she went out places and she used her teeth, people would look at her weird, which she was comfortable with, but it made people she was with uncomfortable. And she wanted to feel like she wasn't making her friends feel awkward, making her family feel awkward. And this was a way where people are much more comfortable in a public environment seeing her use a tool and not feeling bad for her, not feeling pity on her. Feeling like, oh look, she's got something to help her live her life on her own. And uh, that was something that means so much more than $8 in plastic 3D printed parts and a few people's time. But that product is now online. After every one of these maker fairs, one of these makeathons, we put everything online for the public. One of the neat things about some of the programs that we use to distribute these is that when people download them, you can see where they're downloading them, and then once they make them, they can upload pictures of them using the thing, kind of as giving gratitude back to the uh, original inventors. And so we're seeing people that we have no connection with all over the world in these communities where they're finding this, they're having someone make them for them, and they're having pictures posted back online. So we're getting first-hand view, just like uh, their, their lead marketing person uh, is showing the world the value of these things, and, and that's what we're seeing over and over again. And so one of the things I will mention before I close up today is uh, with this specific Tom event that we're throwing in D.C. in July, we really want to focus on taking these technologies even further than just putting open source plans and instructions on the internet and building some organizations like Enable to help continue moving these projects forward perpetually, continuing like they've done with their community, um, building new tools and variations to fit different demographics, and uh, we look forward to, to working with you guys and, and incorporating all these great changes and this great technology to really 
repair the world. Thank you. Now I get to ask the panel some questions, and if we have time, so will you. Um, we, when we started putting this panel together, we talked about what was the potential, particularly in the health and quality of life area, of 3D printing and related technologies to improve health and life in the developing world. But one of the things we learn more and more is that it's not, as Bo said, just in the developing world. It can be in California or New York or Rochester or Washington, D.C. Um, so I'd like to ask each of you, starting with Bo, um, for a quick example of how you envision or know of technology improving life in the developing world and to give that example on top of the U.S. example you just gave. Sure, sure. So that's a good question. So I have one that I like to use as a go-to, and I've said it enough times, so hopefully I can say it pretty eloquently. Uh, and one of the challenges when you're explaining these things, it's a niche environment, right? You're explaining to somebody a solution for a problem that they didn't know existed. Uh, I know I didn't know about it. Maybe um, many people in this room are, are more tuned into these needs, but uh, just as much in America, but even maybe more so in many countries, sports is a very involved part of their life, especially in, in the young ages. And so soccer in a very large part of South America is life, right? It's everything. And to be a, a young person growing up, not able to play soccer because you don't have access, you don't have the use of your legs, is absolutely crippling to your social and, and, and development. Everything, everything you do is based around that. And, uh, and so one of these parents came in, they were from, I think, Venezuela, and they said that their son is eight years old, all his friends joined soccer this year, and his entire life is just shut down because he just does not have access to the social values that he used to have, where they watch movies together and do homework together. Now they all want to play soccer and he can't play because he's in a wheelchair. Uh, and so what the team created, I think you saw a flash of it there, it was like a little off-road uh, car, electric, uh, like four-wheeler looking thing. And we built uh, a kicking foot on the front of it. And the foot had a couple buttons on the handles that would control it, so you could kick left, right, or straight. And it, you know, it's not the same as being able to run around on your own legs, but what he found in this interesting niche environment as we explored the use case with him is that there's always a time when they're taking shots on goal. You guys probably know what I'm talking about, you know, practicing your, your shots on the goalie. And a lot of times you miss, it goes behind the net, someone's gotta go get it, everyone hates to do that. Well, this kid now has an artillery, a mobile artillery unit, and he loves to do this, and they love that he participates. He helps get the balls back for them. He has this great time because he gets to launch these things pretty powerfully back into the field. So he plays this special role now. He's like a super goalie. And, and that has brought him so much back into the fold that he's asked to play on other people's teams. He's asked to come to their practices. He's a valued commodity in his community. And to make that kind of a shift where he was going so far down one path, and then to come 180 degrees back the other and really succeed and, and be incorporated into his community is kind of the dream success story. And uh, I think that's something we're very proud of. And I think it's something that it's, uh, is a good example of how you have to investigate the use case because it's very different in a lot of places, but people are often the same. John, I'm pretty sure you have another U.S. example of um, the impact in the first world of the superhero arms. Well, you know, we had a... Um, Near the mic, please. We, we get this all the time, but the superhero um, arms and hands in, in the Western world, I like to say we make children smile, we make parents weep, and we make nerds rejoice. And this happens, <laughs> this happens every darn time. Um, we had a mother say that she was skeptical as to whether her child needed one of these because he'd been born that way, he didn't know he had a problem, and indeed he didn't, he could do virtually everything, but he wanted one. And he had the experience the very next day, she said, we were in the park, and as often happens, if another kid came up, 
and said, how come your hand is so weird? And instead of being embarrassed, she said, this time Billy said, well, I have a special hand, and come on over here, I'm going to show you my special robot arm. Mm -hmm. And they started playing together in the park, and 20 minutes later, these now fast friends say goodbye, and the other kid says, you are so lucky. <laughs> and indeed, I don't know whether that kid is still wearing this device, but it's already made a big difference. This is at least as much about the, um, the change in the way they think about their unique limb difference, the way they change in the way they think about themselves, the change in the way they think about their environment and the way they relate to it, and I think the way, a change in the way we think about our environment and what we can do with it. And so that, so that seems to be a really powerful pattern. The, the, the psychosocial value um, is something that Eleanor and the EIH team also learned about in Haiti, where the engineers and designers among us were a bit disappointed that the primary interest wasn't in the functionality of tweaking the devices, but Eleanor, you want to talk about? Yeah, we just um, uh, something that we mentioned earlier. Um, nobody would uh, not take advantage of a functional arm, but really, the single most important factor was uh, mitigating the absence and the the um, uh, looking so different and being shunned because because the, the culture, um, including beliefs in voodoo and so on, um, scapegoats uh, the disabled to a large extent. So, um, I mean, the other thing we discovered was we know that there are children in Haiti that could probably use this, but they, we don't, we, they don't appear at clinics, adults do. Um, and the hierarchy of needs is very different in a place like Haiti. So those are some of the so psychosocial lessons that um, we learned. The developing world offers um, entirely different challenges than working in a maker space in Reston. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, it's probably worth mentioning both some of the things that EIH faced and how you're dealing with those challenges or pilot testing solutions to those challenges. Uh, no, I mean, I, I think um, one thing we're, we're very interested in exploring um, as well as offering this training is, is seeing with the bright support, what kind of indigenous enterprises can come. Um, and I think with a lot of development projects, you, you, it's, it's a balance of trying to provide the right support to, to create an enterprise, but at the same time, you want to make sure the enterprise is actually a fit and not something that we think should exist um, in that environment. So that's, that's something I'm curious about. And all three of you work with and are familiar with 3D printing and related technologies. Um, what's the most important thing you learned about the benefits of working with 3D printing and the limitations of working with 3D printing, particularly in the, the helping device field? John? Uh, the benefits is that it means that there are potential solution providers all over the world who can make almost anything. Uh, the problem is they're not magical devices that will actually make almost anything. They enable people to do this kind of thing, but they're still actually quite finicky. And so it, it also creates problem-solving opportunities and problems that need solving. I was hoping you were going to get to problems of scaling. <coughs> It's a softball. <laughs> well, I'm going to go to Bo first because I expect he, he may talk about prototyping and innovating and iterating. Sure, sure. So uh, at Nova Labs, we are a very, very diverse uh, group, and it covers everything from arts and crafts to bioengineering. I'll come in one day. We do like 900 events a year. And so I'll come in one day and we'll have 
a couple classrooms going. In one classroom, we'll be learning how to use a CNC embroidery machine to sew uh, monograms on clothing and things. And then another classroom will be extracting the DNA from strawberries. So it's just, it's a grab bag. Uh, and so the way that we use 3D printers is so diverse, uh, it's almost like it's one of these items on a shelf in a grocery store, like on a potato chips or something. You're just kind of looking, and in the back of your mind you're thinking, which one of these do I think would taste the best to me right now? And so people are, are coming in and they're seeing all these projects, or they're into something specific like car parts, making parts for their cars, and then they go to this shelf and it's got a laser cutter and a 3D printer and a CNC machine and a bunch of woodworking tools and you know, they're just kind of figuring out what they want. And that, that 3D printer is a very important tool in terms of uh, kind of having it in the back of your mind as a resource. Because a lot of times you're like, okay, I can use the Arduino computer system for this and I can use the, you know, the nuts and bolts from the hardware cabinet for that. But there's something missing that kind of, I need something to put it together. All right, I'll just 3D print it. And that, that go-to is uh, the key in, in making things happen faster, kind of figuring out what works and what doesn't. And, and just in general, I think when you've got access to a variety of tools, 3D printing is, is just one of them. Uh, it gives you the ability to think bigger, right? To not feel limited. Uh, there's the old saying, uh, when your only tool is a hammer, all your problems start to look like nails. And this 3D printer is a Swiss Army knife. It just does so many different things and enables you to, to think so many different ways. Do we have time for questions yes, from the... Yes, sure do. Um, is your arm up? Uh, yeah, uh, my question is... John, you Could you mentioned? speak up? It's hard to hear. Oh, I was just coming from... John, you mentioned that a lot of times what happens when you give a child a prosthetic such as this is that you're warning them that soon they'll have to replace it um, and they'll have to find access to a 3D printer to do that. Um, so I guess my question is twofold. First, do you, does your service offer some kind of connection with re telling them where the local 3D printers are uh, so that these kids can find that? And second, um, Bo, when you do your maker uh, you know, make off. Yep, make it um, on, yep. Uh, are you requiring of your makers that if they're making for something like a kid in Venezuela, you know, he's only going to fit in that car thing for, you know, maybe a year? Um, so what are they doing to make the, the solution they're coming with sustainable? So it's not like, you know, those television, TV building, house shows where, like, all of a sudden people who live in it can't afford to live in it. Uh, so I guess those are my... John? My answer is yes. Um, it okay. turns out we are creating relationships, not delivering devices. And if they, in, in truth, often is not, if they need an upgrade or a replacement, that's what they get. If they need a replacement, they get an upgrade because the designs are evolving through, again, a community design process very quickly. We, uh, we are building a global village. And um, one of the phrases that John usually uses but didn't um, today is to talk about it being high touch, high technology. And those relationships are critical um, because kids do outgrow assistive devices like shoes. Their needs change, the uses, their, their needs change. Um, and not everyone, it, it's not one size fits all, and not everyone can use the same kind of device. And there are people that we have to say no to because we don't have yet the right solution for their current need. Um, there was a question here. And this is for Bo. Um, so as an aerospace engineer, you obviously work with parts, and uh, you know traditionally you would fabricate them, machine, extrude it somehow. How does that compare with sort of ramping up to that product, which obviously would be mass produced, to how you exist in the 3D world? I mean, are, are all the sort of developments the same? It's just that you're not, in the end, producing a thousand widgets, you're producing one, or is, is there a comparison or contrast you can make on sort of the aerospace version of this and what you're doing in the 3D world? All right, so you asked the magic question. I think you get show and tell now. <laughs> all right, hang on, hang on one second. <laughs> so we had a, a need knower 
who uh, was unable to leave their house due to uh, some uh, health issues. And they said they love the idea of traveling the world. They watch all these videos online of great, amazing places, these videos of, you know, beautiful mountaintops and so forth. And they said as much as they liked that, it made them very sad to know that that's a place they would never go. And just hearing them tell these stories was like, it's, <laughs> it's an emotional journey, these make it thoughts I don't think people have ever been this close to humanity in the maker community, right? We solve problems with machines if we either fix them or we talk to them and make different ones that are better. And this humanity issue is new. So we said, well... And healthy for all you engineers. Oh my god, it's eye-opening. It's, it's like nothing. I, I was bitten bad. I, as soon as I left that San Francisco one, I, I told them the next day, I said, we got to bring this to D.C. This, I want to be part of this. And I think you guys will all feel the same way. I think you're already inspired. I think that's why you're here. Uh, and I think that uh, this rabbit hole will take you to places uh, that will change your life. So to answer your question, the person wanted to see the world, knew they never would, felt very bad about it, felt like they were seeing other people's adventures, not their own. And uh, we said, well, we got a couple guys here who really, really love drones, right? I mean, they, they race these things. If there's such a thing as professionally, they do. Uh, and we said, but they're not really as high performance or as easy to use as you might need. Uh, so let's see if we can 3D print one for you that's a higher performance. And the way this thing works, it actually has a camera on the front with a little transmitter, and the person wears goggles, wears like a, a camera on their face, like that Google Cardboard, and when they turn their head, it rotates the camera. And when they lean forward, it flies forward, and when they lean their head left, it rotates left. So they can actually fly around anywhere in a way that we can't even imagine in our normal lives. And uh, let me tell you, first of all, they loved it, loved it, and we were able to put together some funding so they could have one, and uh, there's communities all over the place to help them fix it, but I think the coolest part is that as soon as we got done building this thing for them, everybody wanted one, right? It doesn't matter what your situation in life is, and so uh, this sort of thing is 3D printed parts, it was kind of modified and, and, and adapted towards what they wanted to be able to do in terms of how fast and how safe and how easy it was to control, uh, but that was kind of a nice hybrid for me, I felt like... If that's not my wheelhouse, I don't know what is. And that was a very rewarding feeling. Um, I think we have time for one more question, but the scalability issue is one that we all wrestle with and that the Enable Community Foundation, in fact, was funded by Google to try to address, to figure out you know, how to scale um, what we do in a sustainable fashion. Uh, there was one question in the back of the room, the man with the camera. Hi, thanks. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a photographer. I just showed up to kind of take your guys' pictures and listen. I think it's really interesting. Um, what I primarily shoot is wildlife. And I find that the way you talk about how children don't show up to the hospitals, uh, they're not really capable of making their own decisions that way and really vocalizing their complaints, or if they even know they have an issue. Kind of like you said before, they were born with it. Uh, I find that there's actually many animals with issues. I don't mean to sound like, you know, a hippie who cares more about the animals. I certainly don't. But I think there's definitely a... a uh, an opening there. I've seen uh, whales or, or different kind of species, as called, whether it's you know amphibious or not, uh, with problems with their limbs. And we build these prosthetics, and the ones that I've seen so far are really, really elementary. They're not. It's like no thought has gone into them at all. Uh, there's an elephant one for an elephant that lost its leg, and it was basically a, a wooden pole. It, it didn't have really any movement to it. And I wonder, do you feel like that there's a, a good point in? pursuing animals and it will help the overall kind of goal or do you think that's not something that's on your on your radar? I've forgotten what they're, co they're called but there is a community of um, veterinarians and vet techs that have been working and, I, and one of them posted um, in the Google Plus community um, a while ago about how to work and develop an interest group or a community interest about doing that. I there, there have there have been John. there have been some three d a brilliant three d printed set of four legs for a puppy dog, really a wonderful a, a, a huge project, and they made that dog very happy, um, and a whale for a dolphin, a, a tail for a dolphin, and uh, a leg for a chicken. Um, however, some of us are trying to focus on the human need right now. Um, I think that. We are about out of time. Courtney, do we have time for one more quick question? One more. All right. Do we have another quick question, or shall I ask one? What 
Um, I'm going to address this to Eleanor and John. Um, what's the most important thing you've learned from your engagement that you want to share um, with EIH or Enable? Ladies first. <laughs> um, I, I just think you can you can do a certain amount of research, but you have to go and listen and look. And it's a very basic uh, truism, but um, I think a lot of project people, designers, they get very intoxicated by the design process. And it's important to remember who you're designing for and include them in the process, which is actually the core of, of how Enable works. So um, that's it. Um, I think the most important thing we've learned is that it's not, this is not really about, uh, about prosthetics. It's, well, it, it's hard to say what it is about, but it's about something much, much broader. Um, and the, well, it's about people, it's about, it's about this, uh, it seems to me there are things that governments have failed to do, that businesses have failed to do, that NGOs have failed to do, that a global community of connected humanitarians seems to be able to do. And that's the biggest discovery, I think. Um, we don't know how it's going to unfold, which is the other big discovery. But it's, uh, it's a huge opportunity. Thank you all. Let's give one more round of applause.